We keep hearing about how the Chicago Bears are going to have a top five defense this season. The players themselves even refer to it that way. But we should hold off on putting that high of expectations on this group before we see how they come together this season. You are Locked On Bears, your daily Chicago Bears podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. This is Locked On Bears, and I'm your host, Lauren Cox. I'm here to bring you your daily in-depth Chicago Bears news and analysis. You can follow me on Twitter at Cox Sports One, and you can follow the podcast at Locked On Bears on all of your favorite social media platforms, including the Locked On Bears YouTube channel, where you can keep up with all of our video podcasts as well. Thanks for making Locked On Bears your first listen today. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by GameTime. Download the GameTime app, create an account, and use our promo code LOCKEDONNFL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. On the show today, we look at what it would take for this Bears defense to be a top five group in 2024. What that means, what that would look like on Every level of this defense, from the secondary to the linebackers to the defensive line and how that has to come together, where there are still some questions there, but it's still definitely realistic and within reach, and how maybe we don't need to set the expectation that high and we can still be happy with a defense that's very good, even if they don't technically finish top five this season. But part of the way the schedule plays out this year will lend themselves to to getting off to that kind of a, a defensive reputation as the year goes on. But clearly, when you look at this Chicago Bears defense, we know that the strength is in the back seven, and that's their path to being a top five defense, is the linebackers, the cornerbacks, and the safeties generating turnovers, making big plays in the passing game. And of course, like the running, the run defense was already top five last season. So you sort of would hope that given how little has changed in this defense, that if you're bringing back the same essentially the same kind of group that a team that was fifth in yards per attempt allowed that season and first in rushing yards allowed last season should be able to maintain that kind of level. Even if we have some questions about the pass rush that we'll talk about in a little bit here, but like in terms of that back end, a lot of the ability to remain, you know, that top five quality defense, the way they finished out last season is to keep that turnover number high. Generally, it's difficult for teams to maintain a high number of turnovers from year to year. That tends to fluctuate quite a bit from year to year that to remain the Bears were tied for the most in terms of interceptions last season in the NFL with 22 and keeping that rolling at number one is difficult to do, but you can still remain higher on the spectrum. There's just some luck that sometimes goes into turnovers, but you start to look at like where different Bears players were last year. I think there's room for some guys who didn't have that many interceptions to maybe have a few more and maybe room for some guys who had quite a few to not necessarily be able to maintain that exact kind of pace, right? So last year, your interception leaders on the Chicago Bears was a a three-way tie with Jalen Johnson, Tyreek Stevenson, and Tremaine Edmonds all had four total interceptions each last season. It doesn't seem unrealistic for someone like Jalen Johnson to hover around that four interception mark, right? He, He dropped a few last season and generally over the course of his career hadn't been able to really finish those plays as interceptions, but seemed to all click last season. We feel like, okay, he's kind of reached this point where, you know, four is not an unreasonable number for him. If he had had six or eight, maybe you'd say, yeah, he's not going to get six or eight every year, but like four is a decent goal there. Tyreek Stevenson had four as a rookie. We don't know, you know, there's not really a longer track record than that to say, okay, is that something he can sustain? Maybe. I think he was taking some chances as a rookie that sometimes paid off. He certainly was one of the most targeted cornerbacks in the NFL. I would expect his targets to remain high because of Jalen Johnson on the other side and Kyler Gordon in the slot. So he may have a similar number of opportunities. Maybe four is a lot to ask of him, but not unreasonable and out of the question. The one that's interesting for me is Tremaine Edmonds. Four interceptions for a linebacker is quite a few. It was the career high for him. He'd never had more than two in a season prior to that. You don't see a ton of linebackers consistently year after year record four interceptions like certainly that kind of thing you know happens every year it's not like he had some record setting turnover generating season but like between him with four and then tj edwards is next with three 
interceptions last year. They had seven interceptions just between their two primary starting linebackers. That is a lot of interceptions from your linebackers. Edwards was tied with Fred Warner and Logan Wilson for the most in the NFL. And then TJ Edwards was tied for technically fourth after those guys with a couple of, so you had the two, you had no, no linebacker duo in the NFL had more interceptions last season than Edwards and Edmonds. The closest was Greenlaw and Warner with the 49ers who had four and two respectively, but like that's, that's about it. I mean, it's hard to expect a guy like Edmonds, who's only had four, who never had four before this season and never had more than two to keep up four every year. And Edwards had never had more than one in a season and had three this year. So you might expect maybe you're not going to get seven picks from Edmonds and Edwards. Maybe that's five between the two of them. I mean, again, then the interception number is not the only measuring stick here, but it, it's just where you go like, OK, but then you can kind of compare Kyler Gordon had two last season. Could you expect more than two from him this year if he can stay healthy for a full 17-game season? Perhaps. And both your safeties last season, Brisker and Eddie Jackson, each only had one. You would think Brisker and Bayard this year might be able to each generate more than one. So maybe you can make up for a few that you might lose where Edmonds and Edwards probably won't have the same number. But maybe some of the other guys that didn't have as many interceptions will have more. And I, could, I think it's a pretty reasonable expectation to say, Across the board, this defense should be able to maintain a relatively similar number of interceptions as a result. And I and we already talked about like the run the run defense should be able to remain pretty similar if you know you got the same linebackers and a lot of the same defensive linemen, you know, minus Justin Jones and Unique Ngakwe. I don't know that they were the the, the key to the Bears run defense. You know, I think it's kind of a, a collective front seven there with Andrew Billings being a big part of that, the linebackers being a big part of that. And, you know, obviously the some of the lockdown play of the secondary also then allows the front seven to focus a little bit more heavily on the running game there too. So presumably this Bears defense should be able to maintain a high level run defense, should be able to maintain a, a, a high number of turnovers, interceptions at the very least. You know, last year they forced, I think it was 13 forced fumbles. We've heard them say this offseason, the goal is 20 forced fumbles, 20 interceptions. Last year it was 13 and 22. So 20 might be a lot for forced fumbles to expect, but they're going to try and force a lot out. I think they can keep the turnover numbers pretty high. Maybe not number one in the NFL high, but pretty darn high. They can keep the run defense high. Maybe not number one run defense, but pretty darn high. And so, okay, if you've got a, say, top five in turnovers and top five in run defense, that goes a really long way towards putting together a top five defense. Now, the Bears were towards the bottom of the league last season in passing yards allowed 25th. They were 29th in passing touchdowns allowed 21st in yards per pass attempt. So, you know, below average over the course of the season in some of those areas. And some of that was Tyreek Stevenson getting burned. Some of that was injuries across the secondary for different portions of the season. We didn't get to see this group truly be healthy and together really until down the stretch at the end of the season when lo and behold, they played some of their best football. So that's where you know, you could see some room for improvement and get closer to being true top five caliber defense over the course of the year. The big question, it's been the question of the offseason minus the quarterback situation, but once the quarterback thing was fiddled out, the real question of the offseason has been, how are they going to get after the quarterback? And really to extend it to this conversation, like will the Bears pass rush keep them or hinder them from being a top five defense this season. Can you be a top five defense if the pass rush isn't great? Or can the pass rush be good enough that the, a really strong run defense and really strong secondary play and turnovers is enough to overcome that? So we'll, we'll take a look at kind of where the pass rush production compares from last year to this year and what they kind of have to replace in a similar vein like we did with interceptions. And then, you know, what an addition like a return of Unique Ngakwe might or might not add to that group next on Locked on Bears. This episode of Locked on Bears is brought to you by our friends at Game Time, the best way to get tickets for all of your favorite live events, especially if you want to get out and see some summer baseball this year. You can get great tickets on Game Time. I actually just went to a baseball game for Father's Day with both of my parents, had a great time. And what I love about buying them on Game Time is that I can see my view from my seat so I know exactly where in the ballpark I'm going to be sitting. And then they also have all-in pricing. So you know exactly how much you're going to pay before you get to check out. None of those added fees at the end that make your tickets cost way more than you thought they would. So whether you're picking out big games on the Bears schedule or you want to get tickets for a concert or a comedy show or something in the theater, any kind of live entertainment, 
they've got it at game time. I use it all the time myself. I cannot recommend it highly enough. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create an account and use our promo code locked on NFL for $20 off your first purchase terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem our code locked on NFL for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. This Chicago Bears defense can absolutely be a top five defense if their pass rush steps up and comes to play, that the young players up there continue to make progress and that this group can give you more this season than we've seen from a lot of these guys individually in their career so far in in last season and in years past, that the capability seems like it's there within DeMarcus Walker, Javon Dexter, Zach Pickens, Andrew Billings, and of course Montez Sweat to like get you there, but it's going to take a lot from them. And I, I think back to last season when, you know, until Montez Sweat arrived, the pass rush was underwhelming, lackluster at best. After Montez Sweat arrived, it became, I would say, good enough, but never was it great, but at least was less of a, a massive, a massive liability there. But like you look at where the Bears sack production came last season. And again, it's not a perfect measurement of pass rush, you know, pressures and hits, hurries all matter quite a bit. And sacks are not the perfect way to measure how good a pass rusher was. But, you know, at least it's kind of a uniform set that we can kind of hold next to each other and kind of get a sense of, okay, what a good season versus a mediocre season versus a bad season is in terms of sacks. Montez Sweat led the Bears with six. Of course, he had a total of 12 and a half last season across Washington and Chicago, but six with the Bears. Your second leader in sacks was Justin Jones with four and a half at the defensive tackle spot. He's gone. So that production will be needed to replace, even to just get back to where they were last season, which had room for improvement. Unique Ngakwe had four. He currently is not a member of the team, so that will need to be replaced in some way, shape, or form. Demarcus Walker had three and a half. Javon Dexter had two and a half. TJ Edwards had two and a half from the linebacker spot. Rasheem Green had two. And then a bunch of other guys all had one sack. Too many to, like, you know, list in a graphic per se. But, um, you know, Jaquan Brisker had one as a blitzer. Kyler Gordon, Jack Sanborn, Greg Stroman had one. Zach Pickens only had a half sack. Dominique Robinson only had a half sack. So those are a couple of guys right away that you say, okay, if Pickens and Robinson play more this season with Robinson, maybe your number three or number four edge rusher, they're going to be, in theory, you should really get more than a half a sack over the course of the season from Robinson. If Zach Pickens is going to play more, you should get more than half a sack from Zach Pickens. Maybe not five, but could you get two instead of 0.5? Like, I think that's not out of the question here. You also have Austin Booker coming in as a fifth round pick who should be able to add a couple of sacks in there. Jake Martin signed as a free agent could add a couple of sacks in there, maybe to replace Rasheem Green's two sacks. You know, you can get from that, but then it's like, okay, you need Dexter to go from two and a half to five. I mean, is it reasonable to expect him to ask him or to ask him to double his sack numbers in year two? I think we are very quick to overestimate how quickly Jervon Dexter is going to develop. And I've been trying to preach patience with him throughout this offseason because consistently, and I should, we should go through at some point and look at other defensive linemen for this. Consistently, you see defensive tackles in particular in the NFL. It takes three or four seasons before you really see them at their best and take that big step forward. I think about Derek Brown of the Carolina Panthers who just got that big extension from them. Like didn't make the Pro Bowl in year four, showed a lot of promise for the first couple of seasons, but it was two sacks, three sacks, one sack. Like he's never been a huge sack production guy, but really made his presence a lot more felt this, this last season in year four as he finally kind of adjusts to the speed and the strength and the size of guys in the NFL and the technique of opposing offensive linemen are just so much better. It's not to say it's going to take Javon Dexter four years to do anything, but to expect that like, okay, year two, he's just going to be a premier pass rushing into your defensive tackle, I think is asking a lot and is less likely. I, you know, asking him to go from two and a half to four or five sacks isn't out of the question, but to go from two and a half to eight, I've seen some people throw out, oh yeah, eight sacks for Dexter this season. I'd be really surprised 
if he's able to get up to that kind of number. Let's start with modest increases from two and a half to, f- to four or maybe five if he can stay healthy and, and really take that big step forward. Same thing for Demarcus Walker, right? Okay, three and a half last season was a big step down from the seven he had had the year before with the Tennessee Titans. Can he get back to seven this year or at least like six? You know, like he, over his career, he was getting, you know, four, four and a half for a couple of seasons. So like if he's going to be the starter again, opposite Montez Sweat, I think we could say, hey, go from three and a half to, to five or six. Benefit from Montez Sweat. Big question is whether or not they bring back Unique Ngakwe. If they bring back Ngakwe, then of course, then Walker's playing time and production will be a little bit lower. But even Ngakwe only had four sacks last season with the Bears, a career low in sacks for him. Could he benefit from then instead a full year of playing with Montez Sweat and maybe a full healthy year because he was hurt about halfway through last season? Like, I don't think he's going to have another four sack season. I'm not ready to say, all right, that's an instant 10 sacks from Ngakwe because that's usually what he gets in his career. But like, could we get back to eight from Ngakwe? I mean, all of a sudden, if you if you re-sign Ngakwe and you get Ngakwe to eight and you put Dexter from two and a half to say, even the four and a half that Justin Jones had last season and you get Walker from three and a half to maybe say, five off the bench and say Montez Sweat gets you 10. So maybe you get 10 from Sweat, eight from Ngakwe gives you 18, maybe four and a half from 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 uh, Dexter gives you 22 and a half, maybe four or five from, from Walker, maybe they call it four and a half to make it easy math, gives you, what, 27. And then the likes of Robinson and Booker and blitzing linebackers and cornerbacks can give you a handful more. And maybe, I mean, maybe is that a path to getting... 30 sacks on this defense. I mean, that's, that feels like a lot. I mean, that feels like very optimistic trying to get things back with guys playing better, but 30 sacks is what the bears had last season, right? That's not even like top five pass rush kind of numbers here. That's just, Hey, can we, how do we get back to the number of sacks this defense had just a year ago when the pass rush, as we said, like not great. I mean, 30 sacks was the second lowest in the NFL last season. And and that, that's with me saying, hey, Ngakwe has a bigger year, Dexter has a bigger year, Walker has a bigger year, and some of these guys off the bench all have, you know, some productive years. That's just to get back to where they were last season. And that's where you get a little bit concerned about whether or not this pass rush will be good enough for this Bears defense to play at a true top five level, or is this secondary going to be hung out to dry too often? Can they keep it up for four or five seconds every passing play where quarterbacks have time to throw against them, have all day in the pocket and and aren't disrupted too much. Like that's where it feels urgent for the Bears to still address that position in some way, shape or form between now and training camp. I do also still want to see how the Bayard Brisker safety pairing plays out with both guys having to play more free safety than, than before. I'm not ready to say like, oh, that's going to be a reason why they're not any good. I just do. It's another thing I want to just make sure is still on our radar too. Of like, it's both of those safeties are going to have to do some different things this season than they have in, in years past, especially Brisker. And with adjustment comes, you know, room for error or mistakes there. So just another smaller thing to keep an, an eye on in the, sort of the backs of our mind. But, you know, all, all in all, not what's going to keep this defense from being you know, a, a potential top five group. It's the pass rush that has the real question here. And I'm left feeling like, okay, maybe the pass rush won't be as great as you need it to be to be a top five group, but like they can still be a very good defense this season without us having to call them top five, top five, top five all off season long when we set the bar so high. But at the same time, like their schedule is going to allow them to make a pretty big splash, I think fairly early on in this year. So we'll kind of look at, how to set the right expectations for this Bears defense and how that might play out over the course of the year. Next on Locked on Bears. This episode of Locked on Bears is brought to you by our friends at FanDuel Sportsbook. Summertime means baseball and you can bet it all on FanDuel, the number one sportsbook for all of your sports betting needs. Whether whether you're Riding the Chicago Cubs roller coaster right now. It's been a it's been a very wild team that can't finish anything. And of course, the White Sox have been a mess too. Or if you just like, I mean, any team across Major League Baseball, you can bet them all at FanDuel. Or you can bet ahead this season on the Chicago Bears. Lines for week one against the Titans. Uh, odds for Caleb Williams passing yards and Roma Dunze's receiving yards. Coach of the year, offensive rookie of the year, and more. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bets. You bet five bucks on anything. If that bet wins, they're going to add an extra $200 into your account. And that you can bet on 
uh, any of the above. If it's a sport, you can bet on it at FanDuel. So to get your $200 in bonus bets, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and add a big win to your summer bucket list. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. We can be excited about how good the Chicago Bears defense can be this season, and we can be hopeful that they can be one of the better defenses in the NFL without having to crown them as a top five defense in May and now June, right? Like that's that's kind of the big thing here is like, do we do we have to say, hey, top five defense on a team that was seven and 10 last season and was picking in the top 10 and also the number one overall pick? Like it's one thing if you were the San Francisco 49ers and you were just in the Super Bowl with one of the clearly one of the best defenses in football all season long, or you're the Baltimore Ravens that had the number one ranked defense in terms of points allowed last season and was pretty clearly one of the best defenses in football all season long. Those, those teams have really earned being like, yeah, we're practicing against a top five defense out here. We're a top five defense for the bears. They certainly played like a top five caliber defense over the course of the second half of the season. But that to me doesn't feel like it's enough of an earned pedigree to say, yeah, we're a top five defense. Don't mess with us. We are already so great. Like it doesn't feel like they've earned it it well enough yet. And I, I don't like to put the expectations so high on it right away because, you know, last season they had that great top five stretch down, you know, down the line at the end of the year. But like we talked about a little bit before on the podcast, some of the teams they were doing it against, like it was impressive against the Detroit Lions twice. They were great against a good Lions offense. And like, that's legit. I stand, I stand with you there. Like that was, those were some impressive showings, but it was also, you know, they beat up on a bad Panthers team, uh, a Vikings offense with, was it Josh Dobbs at that point? Or had they already gone to, you know, some of the other guys? I think they were, I think it was against Josh Dobbs in that game, but they had Nick Mullins play at some point over the course of the season. Like it was not a top tier Vikings offense there, a Browns offense with Joe Flacco, a Cardinals offense with uh, Kyler Murray just coming back off of injury and a lot of missing pieces in that group. And then a Falcons offense with, you know, Tyler Heineke, Taylor Heineke, excuse me. And I think Ritter threw a few passes in that game, but like there were a lot of bad offenses down that stretch. And then the Green Bay Packers in week 18 kind of embarrassed you a little bit uh, at, at times on that. I mean, Jordan Love had some really nice plays in that game and they couldn't stop Aaron Jones. So it's like, it wasn't like the Bears were an indefend. It, it, what is it? Indef- unfallible, unfallible, or indef. Anyway, they weren't like this invincible defense where they never made a mistake over the end of that season. They just had some really good games and a couple of really good games against the Lions offense that was legitimately impressive. Like I'm not here to take that away from them, but like, can we slow down a little bit on the top five stuff? Like the the, the main thing here that that will work against me though is that. When you look at the start of the Bears' schedule this year, it's another relatively light start. I believe I saw a stat somewhere on Twitter, and I don't have the, the source here to, to give it proper credit, but the Bears' strength of schedule for the first 10 weeks is the easiest in the NFL. Again, strength of schedule is not a great measurement all the time, but when we talked about this Bears' schedule, we know it's a relatively light start over those first half of the season, which is great for Caleb Williams to get maybe a lighter runway, but also a great for this defense to really build up like they're going to play a, a not great Tennessee Titans team in week one. Obviously the Texans in week two will be a challenge, but you got bad teams on that schedule, bad offenses like the Carolina Panthers, Washington commanders, Arizona Cardinals, New England Patriots. Like there's going to be some games there where this defense is really picking up where they left off and making some big plays and building up a lot of that confidence, which is good because then they got to play the 49ers and the Lions and the Packers a bunch over a nice little stretch there. Uh, the Vikings in there as well. Like, Maybe the Vikings won't be as tough of an offense, but this defense will be building up some confidence just in time to really get tested. And maybe maybe they'll be exposed a little bit and get brought back down a couple of notches. And maybe, maybe there'll be a stretch early on this season where it's like people are like, oh, this Bears defense is good. And then they get beat up by the 49ers a little bit or the Lions for some reason or the, or the Packers in one of those games. And everyone's like, okay, maybe they weren't as good as we thought they do. And then they finish out the season top 10, you know, as far as like perception wise. And like, that's... Fine. Like that's, that's kind of my whole point here, right? It's like we keep building them up to be a top five defense and that's great. We should aim for that and aim high. But like if they finish ninth in defense, that's great. That's a top 10 defense. Like that's all you need for Caleb Williams, right? That's, that's meeting and probably exceeding expectations. If they're 20th in defense, okay, we got a problem here, but like 
if they're 12th, if they're 9th, you know, if they're 7th, anywhere in that kind of range, like, that's great. That's a good season. They don't have to be top five. We don't have to keep calling them top five all off season long and make everyone have to expect like, all right, let's see top five defense. And if they come out week one against the Titans and struggle to get any pressure on the quarterback or certainly against CJ Stroud in week two and Stroud's got all day and can stand back there and dice him to, you know, with Stefan Diggs and Tank Dell and Nico Collins all day, like might not feel like a top five defense in that game. And we're going to wonder what happened to this Bears top five defense. I'm here to say like, Maybe it's not a top five defense right now, and that is okay. They can be a top 10 defense or even a top 15 defense that has really good games against some lesser opponents and struggles against good offenses. Hey, most defenses struggle against the good offenses. Most defenses are good against bad offenses too, but like that's all okay. This defense can be really good and we can be excited about the defense without having to call them top five, top five all off season long. This is such a top five defense that Caleb Williams is practicing against. And they're going to be a top five defense with all this talent on the back end. They do have all the talent on the back end. But like until we see that talent match on the front end a little bit closer, I'm just weary of, of calling it and and fully investing in it as a top five defense. I'd love to know where you think this Bears defense ranks, where they sort of fit in the echelon of defenses in the NFL as they stand right now. Let us know in the comments here in the Locked On Bears YouTube channel, or you can tweet us at Locked On Bears or post in the Locked On Bears Facebook group. However you do it, just make sure you hit that subscribe button on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. That's going to be the best way to keep up with all of our daily, in-depth Chicago Bears news and analysis. Thanks for making Locked On Bears your first listen today. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. If you're looking for your second listen, don't forget we've got a 24-7 streaming channel for you from the Locked On Sports Today, covering the top stories with local experts on the Locked On Podcast Network, plus our national shows covering every league. So find Locked On Sports Today, streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Fire TV channels app. We'll be here with you on Locked On Bears all off-season long, counting down the days to training camp, already getting closer, and I hope in the meantime that the Locked On Bears podcast still helps you find a way to bear down.